Bonjour à tous. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, thank you for being here. <laughs> Don't worry, <laughs> I will not make the speech in French. <laughs> so, um, thank you for being here. We're going to talk about microservices. And you know, sometimes to um, apps. To, to understand the technology, it's important to look a bit back in the past uh, to see where we are coming from. And uh, I will take a, a risk at the end also to talk about the future. And you know, predicting things in this industry is a bit of a, of a risk. But I see no camera here today, so I can take the risk. I can try to, to, to do that. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Sebastian, Sebastian Stormack. I'm a developer advocate for Amazon Web Services here in Paris. So my job is to talk with you, developers, builders, people that are building solutions collect your feedback, bring that back to our teams in, in Seattle and try to improve our, our product uh, based on that. So I wanted to say that microservices are not new and I'm not the first one telling you that today. Uh, I've been in this industry since quite uh, many years. As you can see, I have white hairs there, 25 years actually. So I saw technology come and go. I managed to adopt some of these technology. I sometimes failed at adopting this technology. Some of them helped me to succeed in, in my project. but. Since mankind is, is writing software, we have the same desire is to, to reuse components, to try to isolate piece of functionalities, to m be able to reuse them, to factor out the complexity of monolithic application. And Emmanuel talked about monoliths, I will talk about monoliths as well. I actually read all these books. <laughs> cannot believe that, probably. I know, Antonio, you did that too, probably. <laughs> uh, the yellow one, they had, that was in the center of my library for many years. But whatever you call it, OLE, Object Linking and Unbending, unbend uh, DCOM, RPC, Corbar, and of course EGB, I saw many of you uh, are Java guys here in, in, in these rooms. These are all they are all implementing the same ideas, trying to have a component that you can reuse, a business component that is available over uh, the network or within uh, a system. And microservices today are, are not very different uh, uh, fr from that. But why microservices are succeeding while this technology doesn't exist anymore? There are a few things that change. And one of the things that change is the ubiquitous protocols that we can use to communicate between services. Today, most of microservice communication are it's made through HTTP or HTTPS. It's not the only one, and I'm going to come back uh, around that. But we have a, a common way to talk uh, between components. And like it or not, JSON is there. And JSON is a fantastic way to exchange state and to, to communicate the, the object state o across the network. And so having that combination of HTTPS and JSON, it's a fundamental different ways of doing uh, software component, I, I don't want to use microservice right now, uh, because if you look at the other technologies that were on the previous slides, uh, it was either proprietary for an operating system like OLE and COM and DCOM, or proprietary around a programming language, even if the programming language is super popular, uh, EGBs is only in, in Java, or it was overly complex and lack of tooling like CORBA, that's probably why CORBA did not succeed, too general, too complex, trying to address too many things at once, and lack of, of proper tools. Uh, I remember one or two application server using Corba, the one from Borlon. Anyone remember Borlon? Yeah, if you have gray hairs <laughs> like me, <laughs> you do remember uh, uh, Borlon. Another thing that changed uh, for the adoption of microservice is the um, easy access you can get to cheap computing resource. And I should not say cheap, because it has a dual meaning in English, uh, but I want to say bon marché in, <laughs> in French, cost-effective uh, computing resource. Actually, uh, in the past, last century, or even at the beginning of this century, if I want to deploy a couple of services, I have to call my central IT department. They have to buy a couple of server. It takes a few weeks because they need to call one of these companies with a blue or red logo to acquire more hardware, and then to provision the hardware into rack, to put electricity, air conditioning, to install an operating system, to install all the management and monitoring tools that are required by your uh, company, company policies. Today, with just a credit card, a mouse, a computer, uh, a network connection, you can go to one of the, 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 the cloud provider, the public pro cloud provider, 
such as AWS, but also our friends at Google, at Microsoft, CleverCloud, and the others. And with a few clicks, you can get your compute environment up and running on demand. You do not need to call us before and to enter into a special relationship agreement, a contractual agreement. And that compute facility is super cost effective. AWS Lambda, for example, functions in the cloud. It's 0.2. US dollar per millions of invocation. So you can call the Lambda function one million times before we are going to charge you for 20 cents. Actually, it's not correct because the first million is for free, it's for us. So you need to call your Lambda function two million times before we charge you for the first 20 cents. So you can get a lot of calls, a lot of activation, invocation for the price of your daily cup of, of coffee that you're taking, uh, going to work. And Docker is in the same vein, not exactly because you need a bit more infrastructure, um, but um, we talked a lot about Docker uh, just before. Uh, so I will focus more on, on uh, cloud function. And to my opinion, the the other things which is different, it's the emergence of, of different ways of programming, different ways of collaborating, all the agility, agile team, DevOps, that helps teams to actually build and own their software and to operate their software independently of the rest of the team. So the emergence of these methodologies also help um, to foster a culture of reuse, of, of, um, of collaboration between different uh, services. So risking a definition is it's quite uh, complex, and my colleagues try to do that uh, with a lot of talent uh, before me. Uh, the industry as a whole is coming, it's converging toward this type of, of definition. I like this one from Martin Fowler. Martin Fowler is a very uh, respected guy in the IT industry. He wrote a book which is like the, the Bible of software programming 25 years ago or 20 years ago with the gang of four, so him and three other guys. Uh, I don't know why I always remember his name and not the other guys. <laughs> Microservice architecture, it's process, um, processes that communicate over a network to fulfill a goal using technology agnostic protocols such as uh, HTTP. So according to me, there are a couple of characteristics of, of microservice. They are independent from uh, each other. They are autonomous, they are specialized, and um, they are run by a, sing a, a single team. Independent, it's quite obvious, they are autonomous, meaning you can uh, replace them, you can change them, you can uh, refactor them, you can even change the technology a microservice is using without affecting the rest of the system. And we are doing that every day at Amazon. We are changing different components of the system without even you realizing that we are working on that. I used to work the last two, three years for uh, Amazon Alexa, and uh, at Alexa, we, we are used to say that it's like uh, making a, a Boeing fly and changing the engine and changing the seats and changing the, the entertainment system in the middle of the flight with, uh, without the passenger to, to notice anything. And that's what you can do with microservice. You can change different services implementation without affecting the whole system. They are highly specialized. Uh, if you look at the Amazon.fr uh, or .com uh, webpage, you have microservice to manage the shopping basket, microservice for the recommendation, microservice for the search engine. And actually, when I say a microservice, it's a set of microservices because each of these functions are implemented by uh, many different uh, microservices. And they are owned by one single agile uh, team. I'll talk about um, that a bit more. So microservice, actually, it's a perfect implementation of the Unix philosophy from the 70s. Sorry, I'm still looking back in the past. But in the 70s, um, Unix was designed around that. Do only one thing and do it well. That's why we have all these little comments uh, today in Linux, like grep, more, oak. Yeah, maybe oak is not perfect definition for that one, but <laughs> okay. So what are the challenge? Emmanuel uh, lists a couple of challenge. I have a different perspective, different angle, which is good because the two together, maybe we <laughs> are embracing all, all, all the challenges. Uh, one of them, and that's the challenge we have at Amazon, is, is this uh, challenge. So it might not be obvious exactly what is this. This is a self-generated map of the microservices. Uh, running uh, Amazon Retail. And on the outer part of the circle, you have all the names of the services and the connections between them is the dependencies that service is calling another services. And the type of gravity you have towards the bottom there, it's the, the main uh, web page, the Amazon.com first uh, page, which use consumes a lot of these uh, services. So how do you manage complexity there? And how do you manage um, 
the whole system, how do you understand the complexity, how do you draw the boundaries between that? I recommend the reading of that book, Complexity Arise When the Dependencies Among the Elements Become Too Important. And talking about dependencies, we know, we know something about, about that. So it all started with a monolith, um, sorry to repeat a bit myself there, but that's actually the Amazon story. In the early 2000s, we had one big monolithic application for the website, for the shopping website, with a couple of Oracle uh, database. It was extremely slow and uh, expensive to actually bring any modification. I talked to a software engineer that was there uh, 20 years ago and says, yeah, when I, I wanted to, to just make a change in a database, I had to call the central DBA team and wait for weeks uh, before this guy would add a colon in a table for my, for my change because these guys were overwhelmed just trying to keep the lights on, try <laughs> trying to, to, to keep with the scalability and, and make the platform work and grow at the, at the speed of the rest of the business. So we start to split the monolith into multiple services and then we split the different services into microservices. And that change is not only a technical and architectural change, it's also a change in the organization. It's the way you organize your company the way you are split in between different teams. So it's m principally, it's, m m m m <laughs> it's mainly a matter of people and a matter of culture, a matter of organization. The technology will come uh, just after that. Remember that you cannot build a complex system that works from scratch. All complex systems that work today are evolution of simple system. So if you start your journey towards microservice, shoot for the moon, Try to think big. No, that's not big enough. Think bigger. And then start with something really simple and create complexity on top of that simple things. Incrementally listening to customer feedback and iterating over the, the systems that you are doing. That's another book I do recommend to read. Systematics, How System Works and How They Fail by uh, John Gall. It's not new, it's also from the 70s. But most of the things in that book are still uh, valid today. A complex system which is designed from scratch will never work. So start small, start by something that you master, something that you can control, and build complexity around that over time. One example is Amazon S3. You probably know Amazon S3, the, the file service, uh, s service from, from, from AWS that allows you to store as many files uh, as you want for as many as petabytes as, as, you, as you want. Uh, we intentionally start with a very simple design that would fit uh, Amazon.com requirements to, to for the website itself, for the picture of the items that we are selling on Amazon.com, but that would be flexible enough as well to adjust to the needs of other developers. And since then, we are storing trillions, so millions of millions, of objects, of files, and we peak, we regular peak at hundreds of millions requests per second on Amazon S3. When it started in 2006, so 13 years ago, it was only eight microservices. And today it's more than 200 microservices that are uh, providing the service for Amazon S3. <coughs> Challenges, observability, discovery, security, communication. I think we are getting somewhere in terms of security and communication. Observability and discovery is still uh, a, a pain point with most of the customer I'm talking about. How do you discover services at runtime, at design time? How do you trace, how do you observe? What is observability? Uh, by the way, I will spend a bit more time on, on that one. In terms of discoverability, um, I <laughs> used to be part of some project in the 90s about UDDI, also some people with white hairs that remember UDDI, <laughs> yeah. I never saw uh, succeeding, uh, I never saw a, a UDDI project to succeed. <laughs> so UDDI was the idea to, to create a central repository with all your services, all the interface, all the version, a service that can be used at design time for developer to find what are the services available and how to call them, but also at runtime for microservice or components at that time to locate themselves and locate the latest version so that you can relocate a component independent of the other. Sounds familiar? Yes, <laughs> this is what you're doing today with, with containers, with uh, mesh, for example. Uh, but that technology was, once again, too, too complex. So what we are seeing with our 
customer of today, it's uh, sometimes basic stuff. Basic stuff works. Remember, don't shoot for complexity. Environment variable is a good way to pass a couple of uh, discoverability data to your, to your containers or to your microservices. Distribute a database, etcd, of course, if you are managing Docker uh, containers. DNS works. Uh, I like to joke about DNS being a database, but actually it's a pretty well distributed, stable, reliable uh, database. Latency is not so good, but if you want just to associate key value, sometimes it works. And just publishing an endpoint behind an IP address and uh, the flexibility of changing the IP address might fit that requirement. With some drawbacks as well, you, be you are depending on the, on the client DNS resolver, on the cache. Uh, you do not control these aspects. And then there is tons of other offering, like the ones there, Consul or Reka, uh, Cloud Map. Communication style, um, something changed. In the past, it was mostly synchronous. HTTP, HTTPS. What uh, I observe today is more and more customers are using asynchronous communication pattern. And you talk about messaging, we talk about, about uh, eventing uh, as well. But um, asynchronous communication allows to scale really well, and it allows to manage uh, resiliency or failure much better than, than synchronous communication. Uh, most of our system at AWS are asynchronously, uh, asynchronous, asynchronous communication. It allows us to scale at at, at really large, <laughs> large uh, uh, size. Uh, for example, during the last uh, Prime Day, you know the two days of uh, sales uh, that you have during the summer, we have hundreds of systems, 400 uh, fulfillment center. We have all the Alexa system, all, all the website system that generated at peak 45 million requests per second on DynamoDB. That type of scalability is achievable through a lot of asynchronous uh, system working together with callbacks, with different uh, methods of, of messaging. Um, when you're asynchronous, you manage better the high availability most of the time. If you're using a synchronous system, you don't even have to manage the ability by yourself. Another system will manage that for you, and I will come back to that in, in a minute. Security, that's the part where most of the solutions are in place today. Uh, in the past, it was a bit proprietary. It was based on network security. Uh, it was difficult to verify your security posture. Can you verify or uh, give uh, an attestation saying that the security is correctly implemented. Today, in a public cloud world, it's much easier because you can build your infrastructure with code, you can build your security posture with, with code. Uh, it means you can create a mathematical model of your security posture and you can you can verify that programmatically. So you can verify your security rules, such as networking rules, uh, access rules, permission, to check if your system is aligned with your theoretical definition of your compliance uh, uh, posture, of your, of your security posture. And we see more and more customers going uh, into, into there. Also to automate the security. I mean, if something is changing, uh, the cloud can generate an event. You can trigger code that will actually look at the change and maybe revert the change automatically if the change is not compliant. Uh, the example uh, I'm always taking is someone change uh, networking rules to allow uh, SSH to a machine, that change is detected by a service, by a component that will inspect the change against your compliance uh, definition. And if it is not compliant, just revert the change automatically. That's something which is extremely hard to do on premises, but that you can do uh, uh, in, in the cloud. In terms of identities today, um, we have some kind of standards. Uh, don't build your identity provider yourself unless you are working for Ping, for O0, for Rock, or these type of companies. Most services I know are leveraging some kind of third-party identities. Might be central inside an organization, like your uh, Active Directory, but it might be just login with Google, login with Facebook, login with Amazon, and, and the other. In terms of permission, OOT is there, and uh, JWT is doing a reasonable uh, job at providing uh, access token and um, moving uh, security assertion across, across different systems. Observability is also uh, an area where our customers are, are being a bit uh, challenged and there is uh, uh, so some, some effort to understand, to, to observe a, a large and complex system. Observability is not new, again, this is from the, from the 60s, but um, observability, according to, to Wikipedia, is uh, the art of 
uh, understanding a system just by looking at the output of that system. You look at the si system from outside and you derive from there the status of the, the working, the internal of the systems. You can observe your system from the network, you can observe your system from the operating system, or you can also observe your system from the application by taking measurement directly inside the application. And um, if you read that book, and that's the third book I'm, <laughs> I'm recommending, uh, Distributed System Observability by Cindy uh, Shridharan, she defines three pillars of observability, event logs, uh, metrics and tracing. It's three different things if you think about that. I an event lock, it's an immutable timestamp set of events. So it's basically a timestamp, an event, a timestamp, an event that cannot be modified, mostly generated by one application or one services. The metric is different. The metric is uh, measurements that, you, uh, that your system are generating, like how many HTTP requests uh, do I receive, how many purchases there is on Amazon.com, how many play there is on uh, Netflix. And just by looking at the metrics, you can derive information about how the system is working. For example, Netflix is observing not only technical metrics, but also business metrics. How many people are playing the play button of their remote control at any given time of the day? If that metric falls, it's not because people do not like to watch TV anymore. It's because there is something that changed, something that prevents the people to actually watch uh, TV. So they use business metrics uh, to trigger alarms and uh, to trigger their operational uh, team. And tracing is a bit different, is to take an event, an event that happens into your system and be able to trace, to correlate it between multiple uh, pieces of your system. So it's really to trace a request from the time it enters into your system, goes through many components, database, microservice, other service, and finish, and, and collect all these uh, events across multiple uh, systems. Tools that we are using to, to to implement that, it's log aggregation, analytics, alerting for the metrics, and visualization tools such as uh, X-Trace for uh, the, the tracing part. Uh, once you have good observability, it's also opened the door to uh, chaos engineering. And chaos engineering means injecting some failure into your system to see how the team and the system will uh, answer to that failure. And the two is important there, how the system will react, but also how the teams uh, will react. At Amazon, we are doing something we call the game day. Uh, it's a lot of preparation. All the teams are informed, but we intentionally inject failure into our production system to see how the system reacts and how the teams react. And the goal of, of that is to not impact customer, uh, customer experience. So as long as there is no impact, visible impact for customer, the team is good, and we can go for the next game day. Netflix is doing that as well. I uh, will go more into uh, chaos engineering at DevOx, if you are attending uh, DevOx, and I know some of you in the room will attend DevOx in Belgium in November. I will uh, uh, go into much more details about chaos engineering. I will talk about that at uh, Xebicon here in Paris uh, a bit later uh, this month uh, as well. So don't forget the human factor. It's I mentioned human factor several times during, uh, during this talk. Uh, at Amazon, if you build it, you run it, um, meaning that the teams are in charge from A to Z, from the code to the production. It allows the team to be much closer to their customer, the ones that are using the service, so to receive the feedback faster and to close the loop and to iterate in the name of their customer much, much faster. Uh, we try to have small teams as well, because small teams help to uh, improve communication. If you have three person in a team, you have three ways to communicate. Uh, if you have five person in a team you cannot see my blue lines there but if you have five person in a team uh, you have 12 ways to communicate so it's a factor of uh, n square and n minus one on, on, on two so we try to keep the, sti the team quite small uh, a small team is more agile it's more nimble it's easier to communicate it goes faster and what is the right size for a team at Amazon uh, we answer that uh, by giving two pizza <laughs> so the ideal team uh, at Amazon is two pizza I mean if, if you can feed <laughs> your team with two American-sized pizza, <laughs> then the team has the right sides. Otherwise, it's time to split the team and to create a smaller team. If you are a hiring manager, think about diversity as well. Uh, and think about 
the team abilities as the sum of the cognitive abilities from the entire uh, uh, team. So let's say that uh, Adam has five cognitive abilities, like he can code in iOS, in Java, and blah, 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 A, B, C, D, E. So if you have three person in front of you, what is the best combination for your team? Maybe instinctic instinctively we would choose Adam and, and Betsy because it's five and four, the other are four and three. But if you look on the top line, there is a lot of overlaps between their cognitive uh, abilities. So if you hire these two guys, the team ability will be six, A, B, C, D, E, F. But if you hire these two guys, the team ability will be seven. Y your team as a whole will have more capability, more abilities uh, than, than the previous one. So if you are a hiring manager, think about diversity. There is a high bonus by uh, leveraging diversity in your team. And by diversity, I'm, just, I'm, I'm not just talking about male, female <laughs> diversity. I know it's a hot topic these days, but all type of, of, of uh, diversities. So let's finish with what I see for the future. And I told you at the beginning, I don't want to take any risk. Uh, so the future I'm going to describe is actually the present for some very large company like Amazon. And I'm bet our friends at Google, Microsoft are doing the same. I know that our friends at Netflix are, are doing the same. But when I'm talking with customers um, and describe these techniques, sometimes they look like it's, it's science fiction. So for them, it's really the future. So let's look at the future for the majority of us, which is the present for some companies right now. The only code that you will write is business logic. All code that is related to infrastructure, to technical services, I don't know, JDBC connection pooling, uh, any type of identity authorization code, it's, it's not providing any business value for your customer. It will not make your application significantly different or better than the competition. Remember that code is a risk, code is a liability, code is a cost. So if you reduce the number of lines of code, you reduce the risk, you reduce the cost, and you reduce the liability. You will deploy on serverless. Nobody likes to manage server. OK, I know some guys that like to manage server. But it's, it's not because you are the king or the queen at patching a Linux server or deploying Kubernetes uh, on, on a couple of machines that your application will be better than, than your competitor's one or that your service will be better for your customer. So let us or any other public cloud provider do the heavy lifting. Managing a server has no business value. Managing a container orchestration solution has no business value. And I know very few people that like to do that. So go serverless. Serverless is the future. You don't need to manage the server, the operating system. You just write business code, and you deploy your business code. And of course, you automate everything. You automate the creation of the infrastructure, like your database, your network security, and stuff like that. But you also automate your continuous uh, deployment and continuous integration pipelines so that when a new developer comes to the team, he can get very quickly with its own development environment, its own cloud environment, its own uh, CI CD pipeline. And I will talk about CI CD and automation of CI CD uh, during the afternoon, so come to my uh, session as well. And the last one is make a difference between code deployment and code activation. In the past, and today, for the majority of companies, when you deploy code, the code is exposed to your customer, and the code is visible and starts to be used. At Amazon, we deploy code sometimes months in advance before the code is actually activated. It allows us to run tests and to run experiments and to give early access to some customer and not other customer. So how we are doing that? Using a design principle called feature flag or feature toggle, and there are many libraries that can help you to do that. But at high level, basically, you deploy your code, and inside your code you say, if the toggle is activated, if the feature is activated, then I'm doing that, otherwise I'm doing that. So the code has the two different versions, and you can provide different uh, experience, customer experience, depending on the fact the feature is activated, activated or not. And you can activate the feature for all your customer or for selection of your customer. If this is Seb, then he will see that experience. Otherwise, you are going to see another experience. It allows to gather feedback from customer and to fix things before it reaches the majority of your customer. It allows to gain confidence on the stability of your systems as well. So as a short recap, and I have just one minute for that. Um, <coughs> if you need to take away four things from, from this session. First, 
Welcome to the world of microservice. It's not new. The software industry is doing that since 30, 40 years. We are just doing it a bit differently right now, which allows them to succeed. And I say microservices are there for to, to stay, not like all the other technology I was talking about at the beginning of this talk. Um, it has a couple of challenges. Main two challenges, my two challenges are the discoverability, the observability. How do you debug, how do you observe, how do you maintain the complexity between uh, all these uh, microservices? But try to reduce your operational burden and go serverless. You should not spend managing infrastructure. Let someone else do that. That's our job. That's not your job. Your job is to write amazing app for your amazing customer. And finally, focus on your business logic because this is where you can have... That's my time is done. <laughs> because this is where you, you have value and this is where you can make the difference and this is your business. Only you can do that. Writing code to create a database or to import data on a database, that's an undifferentiated heavy lifting. So leave that to uh, someone else. If you want to learn more about AWS, and I'm talking for the, the Frenchies here in, in the room, I start a podcast in French about AWS. So just type uh, podcast AWS en français on any podcast platform. And that being said, thank you. Do not forget to leave me feedback. I will be here all day. And you can also reach me on Twitter on Sebsto, S-E-B-S-T-O. Thank you.